<laughs> I was just think, thinking about that song. Um, you know, the devil went down to Georgia. You know that song? You remember? That? The devil went down to Georgia looking for a soul to whatever it was. I can't remember. <laughs> and. Uh, but the fiddle playing in that is pretty good. I, this is like a good song. I have to, yeah. What made me think of that song is that uh, we often don't realizing, realize the deals we're making with spirits who are very dark. You know, we're often making a lot of deals, deals with them, you know. And uh, some of the deals with them are things like, Oh, you tell me secrets about other people and I'll allow you to feel certain things through me, you know. Uh, and often these deals are made emotionally. They're made because we have addictions. And so, for example, I know some fellows who have addictions to, to just having sex, basically. And the deal they make with the spirits, basically, is allowing the spirits to be present in every sexual interaction they have. Right? And, uh, and they make that deal because the spirits actually set up the sexual interactions. So it's like a, a spirit finds the appropriate woman that they can focus on to get them into, into bed and then the, the person on earth allows the, the spirit to actually be a part of the interaction. So it's almost like every sexual act is a threesome, pretty much. And, uh, and so, you know, we have a lot of these kind of deals happening constantly with different spirits around us because of the unhealed emotions that we have. Now, that all being said, um, let's look at how to protect ourselves and combat, combat these issues, shall we? So what we want to do now is focus on... It's becoming very evangelic, some of you. Like, <laughs> we go, uh, you, you want to have a time when you yell out yeses to all of my... <laughs> no, I'm just... I'm just <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, <Hello. laughs> uh, boy. Anyway, the, uh, it's funny, isn't it, how when truth sort of hits your soul, sometimes you just can't help but burst out, right? Um, but anyway. So let's uh, personalise this a bit. So the battle for my soul. Let's do that. Because what we want to do is focus on our own personal lives here and how we're in this constant uh, interaction with our spirit friends. And, and some of those spirit friends aren't very friendly, obviously. You know, they have quite a lot more interested in damaging our future and damaging our life and causing our unhappiness than they are interested in causing our happiness. So what we want to do is work out how we can combat this, these forces. Now... The prayer itself gives you uh, some of the answers to that. One, is, one was, keep me in the shadow of your love every hour and moment of my life. So this is a prayer to God that we're asking God to keep us in the shadow of God's love every moment of our life. So we'll, I'll analyse these step by step of what's said in the prayer. So this is the first thing, is stay... In the shadow of love and truth. By shadow we mean in the protection, if you like, because it's like if you imagine the hot midday sun coming over, you know, it's 45 degrees outside and you're looking for some place to hide from the sun, really. And this is what a lot of spirit attachment and attack is like, is that it feels like a oppression constantly, and we're looking for something to keep us nice and safe and in a bit more protected environment. And staying in the shadow of God's love and divine truth is number one in that process. Every time you step out of harmony with love or step out of harmony with truth personally, you will automatically now be in an, in an unprotected state as far as God's universe goes. Because you remember, every one of God's laws are about love and truth. So every time I stay in harmony with God's laws, 
I'm starting harmonious with love and truth and so therefore I am afforded the most possible protection that anybody in the universe can ever have. The instant I step out of harmony with love and truth, with my actions and my words or even my thinking, and it is the instant that now I have no longer have the protection of those laws. So now I'm, now I'm in anarchy or I'm in actually opposition to those laws. Does that make sense? Personally. And while I'm in opposition to those laws, now attracted to me is everyone else who's also in opposition. They can actually affect me now. So if I stay in the shadow of God's love and truth, um, that is going to be, afford me the most possible protection at any one point in time for any spirit interaction or anything that's happening on earth. Now the problem is that the majority don't believe that, to be frank. Because what we believe is that that's true as long as we're living in an environment where nobody's hateful or nobody's violent or nobody's... You know, and we'll list all of these different emotions that other people have and we say, but how, how am I protected in that location? Well, the truth is, if I stay in love and truth, the majority of those events will not personally affect me. They may be attracted to people around me who are not staying in love and truth, but they won't actually personally affect me. Now, like I've seen this happen a lot in my life, first century and now, where, where the only people that could affect me were the people who actually were the closest to me. The others couldn't affect me at all, very much at all. And in the end, like I've explained to you today, my own death in the first century was created by the unhealed emotions of those people who called themselves my friends. That was the only way that, they could ever, that I could have ever died, actually, in the first century is by having a group of friends around me who were in an unhealed space and my still accepting them in that space meant that I was almost accepting their law of attraction. Does that make sense? And this is what we finish up doing. So the more I stay in love and truth personally, it's impossible for me personally to be affected except by the interactions that I have with other people around me who are now out of harmony with that love and truth. That's the only way I can be affected. So that's a very important lesson to learn. Now, remember I've said in another talk that there are four sort of levels of emotions that you will probably work through, and this is a bit of an aside. The first level are the emotions. Well, let's, let's convert it into love, actually. So, is how others... Are unloving to others. <laughs> in other words, normally the first thing I see in life with regard to love is how another person has treated another person unlovingly. <laughs> uh, I observe those events usually pretty easily and I can see them quite clearly generally. The, the next level of emotions and feelings that I'm generally less unwilling to do with is how others are unloving to me. Many of you are still stuck in this area, by the way, with regard to your emotions. So, you know, every time you resist the truth about your mother and father, you're stuck in one of those emotions, not willing to see how your mother or father has been unloving to you. Does that make sense? Now that's a group of emotions that are quite difficult to deal with, we think, initially. But there's groups of emotions that are more difficult to deal with than that. All right? So many of us now are starting to deal with these groups of emotions, which is really good. It's an essential part of your progression, but it's not going to be the hardest emotions you have to deal with. Trust me. The next level of emotions that are more difficult to deal with those ones how I have been unloving to myself now they are quite difficult emotions to deal with <clears throat> remember every one of these places if I have unhealed emotions spirits or other people can hook into anyway so these are groups of emotions now the last set of emotions that are the most difficult for me generally to process and move through and also my greatest amount of shame is linked to and also, my, generally, my greatest amount of fear is linked to it as well. 
and my greatest amount of resistance is linked as well, is how I am unloving to others. All right, so, so many of us see that really clearly. When it comes to here, we start processing our emotions. In particular, we start processing emotions about how other people have treated us badly during our life. You know, that mongrel of an ex-husband that you had, you know, and how he occasionally be beated you and expected sex at the drop of a hat and, you know. And then, and then we start getting into the more difficult ones of that, of how my mother treated me or my, my mother treated me is the most difficult probably there for, to, to, to deal with. And then we go into how unloving we ourselves have been to ourselves. Now that's pretty hard because we're so used to other people being unloving to us that we have to firstly generally get through those emotions before we notice how we're being unloving to ourselves. Does that make sense? So we, so we usually have to go through the process of seeing how others have been unloving to ourselves before we start noticing how I myself have been unloving to myself. <coughs> All right. Then the most difficult set is how I am unloving to others. These are the ones that are the most difficult to access. They are the most difficult to deal with at the causal emotional level. There is a high tendency for us to go into self-punishment rather than actually deal with the emotion. And there is a very strong tendency as well to deny all the things that we've done. So we often are very open to seeing all the things that other people have done to us. We're very, very close to seeing all the things that somebody else, uh, 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 we have done to somebody else. I am constantly amazed how one person can come up to me and say, oh, you, when you did that with me, you treated me badly, they feel. And yet... In the entire interaction I've had with that person, literally hundreds of times, they've projected rage, anger, and a lot of other emotions at me. Right? And they don't see any of those emotions as unloving. And this is the problem for it with us as humans, generally. We fail to judge ourselves in the same way that we judge others. Right? And what I mean by judgment here is not... I'm not talking about uh, negative judgment. What I'm saying is we, we fail to see what we do ourselves. In other words, we accept ourselves doing things to others that we would never accept from somebody else doing it to us. Right? Now, many of you ladies are in this position with your men, right? where you're accepting, you, you want your men to do a certain thing to you, but you would never do those things for your men. Right? Right? And, uh, by the way, many of the men are, are doing the same thing, of course. And what we need to do is we need to really start addressing this particular area of our life. Now, our resistance in particular to this area of our life, in particular, is going to cause the majority of our inability to stay in the shadow of love and truth. Do you understand? In other words, my inability to love you and to be in truth with you is going to cause the majority of my problems when it comes to spirits right, who are influencing me in some way. My inability to stay in love. When I can stay in love with you and actually with every interaction, no matter what you dish out towards me, stay in love with you, now no spirit can influence me personally. Now, of course, that's when you become at one with God as well, ironically, and naturally so. So the, the issue is every time we justify our own personal unloving behaviour towards others and our own personal lack of desire to stay in harmony with truth, every time we justify those two things, we are now leaving ourselves wide open to spirit attack. And in that space, we are not staying in the shadow of love and truth. Can you see? Of course we're not. In that moment, we've stepped out of that. You could say we've stepped out of God's shadow in that moment. And now we're on our own, displaying a lack of love and truth. Right? And in that process, obviously, generally, I will be unloving to others, firstly, more so than even being unloving to myself, generally. 
It's our unwillingness to face those emotions that cause a lot of our problems. It's also our willingness to, unwillingness to face those emotions that cause most of our rage, most of our anger, frustration, annoyance, and even slight irritation. Right? Are all caused by our unwillingness to, to face those emotions. The converse is also true in that if I am willing to face these emotions, I can, in the most rapid manner, become at one with God. So that's also true. If I'm willing to face those emotions, if I'm willing to process them and work my way through my resistance to those emotions. And of course, as the, you know, the next emotion's down, they will help again, you know what I mean? So it's like... A scale, if you like. If I'm only willing to face those emotions, then I'm not going to get very far. Right? If I'm willing to face these emotions, I'll get a small distance. But when I start focusing on the last two groups of emotions, that's when I'm really starting to deal with the real crux of the matter in terms of why I am unloving or why I am untruthful. Yep. Ivana, you wanna, is, there, is there a mic in front of you? Um, so with the number four one being the hardest, yep. does that mean we're more likely... Oh, no, hold on. Um, so is it... Now I've just got to try, try and work out. I know what it is in my head. Um, so should I sort of try to access the, um, uh, like, number four emotions or should I just let my i think i've just answered it myself <laughs> um your law of I'm attraction actually ivana yeah. is actually the most powerful thing of course and most of the time for almost all of us it's focusing our attention on number four anyway it's just the most okay. of the time we're trying to re we're refusing that but yeah because um i've been noticing just where i'm living that i i blame others a lot yep. um so that's me. Is me blaming others me like really avoiding the number four thing? Yeah, well, the actual action of blame to another person is actually not loving to them. Just blaming them in that moment is not loving them. There's a whole difference between blaming and telling the truth about responsibility. So there's a big difference between those two states. For example, I can say to you, your mother did not love you. I'm not blaming her there. I'm just stating a truth that she did not love you. Yelling and screaming at your mother because she didn't love you is blaming her and yeah. you're not going to process an emotion deeper than that yeah, uh, sure. if, you, if you stay in that state. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. But we do need to state the truth. Mum, you did not love me. That's just stating the truth. So do I actually... I'm actually a bit confused about um, when we... Should, should we just be telling the truth like all the time like i've been holding back <laughs> no um hold on <laughs> okay now i feel stupid um <laughs> um is it necessary to have to tell the truth like um <laughs> okay there's a no, certain slant she's trying to get at here so <laughs> let, let, let ivana get to it um oh, I, i've sort of lost do you have it. to um, tell the truth even when like se events seem to be remotely associated to you in some way that's um, or, or do you have to say the truth all the time yeah like with my family i've um resisted telling them stuff because i feel like i'm in error myself so how how will i know um like i'm sure that i'll be projecting something at them like if i was telling them Oh, I don't know. I know like, what you're saying. Yep, yeah, I know what you're saying. Um, the truth is that you're, if, you're, if you're projecting something out of blame, anger, you know, irritation, annoyance, any of those emotions, then the truth is you are projecting at them in that moment. But the truth is probably you're also feeling those emotions day to day most of the time, and which means you're projecting at them pretty much 24 by 7 until you release the emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the truth is actually that when I state, oh, I'm blaming you, I'm actually in a better place than if I just blame you without stating and recognising that I'm blaming you. Yep. Right? So okay. the more truthful I become, the better the projection is for the other person. Does that make sense? In other words, they don't receive as much of the projection the more I personally own it. 
So I should really just sort of challenge myself and just speak truth with my family or All the everyone time. else? Yeah, everyone, everyone. Okay. Yeah. So and if somebody comes up to you and you don't really want to talk to them, what do you do? <laughs> you say, actually, I don't really feel like I want to talk to you. And then if you were even more truthful, you'd say, do you want to know why? Because um, I'm happy to tell you that too. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be happy to say that, but um, maybe I should start doing that now. Yeah, yeah. Every one of us should be doing that here. Okay. Oh, you know, you know, have someone come up and they come up to you every time we have one of these groups. They, they just come up to you and they, nah, 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 and they, and they, oh, all of a sudden, and we're not often looking at our law of attraction. Why are we continuing to attract <laughs> this per person that brings up something in us? So we say, every time I come to one of these groups, you want to come up and talk to me. Every time you do, I feel uncomfortable. And, and I've got to look at why I feel uncomfortable. I know, like, what, what's going on? Ah, oh, I feel uncomfortable because it feels like you are needing something from me and you're demanding it of me. And, and I feel like I'm not allowed to be free to be myself when I'm with you. And the other person just goes, ah, oh, that's your law of attraction or whatever, which is an unloving act in itself. But the truth is that if both of us are truthful in an interaction, <coughs> we'll work through emotions really rapidly. If one of us withholds the truth in an interaction, now, now there's a lot less chance of us working through an emotion. Yep. Okay, thank you. Yep. So the truth is very powerful. And, and when you state the truth all the time, you are staying in the shadow of God's truth because that's what God does all the time. So God's, God doesn't allow you to get away with a lie. Ever. Every time you try one of God's laws gets broken. There's a, there's a feeling in your soul as a result. Every, mo every time it happens. If you're sensitive to it, you'll notice it every time. God doesn't allow you to get away with a single unloving or untruthful act. So why would we allow ourselves to? And it's the motive to allow ourselves that allows spirits to hook in, you see? Can you see that? As soon as I allow myself an unloving or an untruthful act, straight away, now... I've got an addiction in play, spirit's got an addiction in play, bang, connects with me, and before I know it, I'm doing unloving and truthful things regularly. Uh, if we go right up the back with the mic, if you keep your hand up. So blame is definitely blame, anger. You know, Any of those anger-based emotions are all very good indicators that we're not staying in the shadow of God's love or truth very good indicators and we want to stay in the shadow of God's love or truth if we want to have protection that's the only way we can be afforded protection yep. that was going to be one of my questions AJ it's just to have light to have a shadow you have to have something in between the light throwing a shadow so uh, I'm, I'm maybe just trying to understand why it's not staying the light of Love and truth and why it's a shadow. I'm perfectly happy to change the words for you, <laughs> if that's what you want. Thank you. That just <laughs> makes me feel better. <laughs> yeah, I mean in the shadow. Like a lot of uh, persecution type uh, feel, uh, events feel like a burning, hot, unbearable situation. And under those circumstances, you definitely enjoy the shadow. You know, And that's why I use that terminology back in the first century, in the first century what was happening is that we'd just walked up a mountain and it was pretty hot that day as well and there was a lot of other things going on and uh, we were sitting around a campfire at night when I gave that prayer um, to a group of disciples who asked about it and uh, that's why I used that terminology. Josh? I just want to say um, when you were speaking about truth there, it's... Um, just as unloving to not speak up that's just as the same as not lying i mean as lying um just like if i feel there's this interaction going on and i'm not saying anything about it that's living a lie it is it is if you feel it and you don't state it then you're actually living in a in a in a in a state that's dual when i say dual i mean two-sided um, and, and every type of state like that is going to damage somebody. Now, you can choose to not speak the truth even though you know it. All right? And there are times when you may need to choose to not speak the truth even though you know it. Uh, for example, if the person you're just speaking to has totally rejected the previous truth you've given, <laughs> then 
Um, they have demonstrated through their free will that they do not want the truth, so therefore you would walk away. You would not speak more truth to them, you would just walk away. And that's why I use the illustration of the first century of casting your pearls before swine. Like a person who's rejecting your previous truth, really they're going to reject the next one, are they not? So what's the point of saying another one? So, but that's a, when you think about it, that is just a, that's honouring their free will. So there are times when you honour a person's free will, but most of us, to be frank, make the choice for the other person before we give them a chance to make the choice. So in other words, I'll make the choice, I don't want to tell Josh that because I'll feel embarrassed, right? rather than telling Josh that and letting myself feel embarrassed and letting you feel what you want to feel. Well, that's the thing, like, I find that unless you speak the truth, the emotion just doesn't, you never access it. It's very, that's very true as well. It's yeah. impossible to access an unhealed emotion while uh, an unloving emotion while you are speaking a lie or withholding the truth from yourself so in other words it's the best tool to access it yes yeah. always and this is why i am very blunt and I, what, what you may feel was blunt what i feel is just truthful with you does that make sense because i know the power of it and it requires bravery and courage to stay in the place of telling the truth all the time Right? There's a quality that you develop within yourself of courage when you stay in that place. And it's only fear that would ever let you out of that place if you, you know, by, by withholding truth from someone. It's an act of love to tell somebody the truth, but it needs to be the truth <laughs> before it's an act of love. Yeah. Um, is it okay? I just want to share something. If sure. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm putting myself on the spot here. Um, about about seven weeks ago, or six weeks ago, yep. I, like I wanted to deal with my abundance issues, and so basically what I did was I let myself run out of money. <laughs> yep. I, let, I, I used up all my savings, yep. and I got to this space where I had no money, yep. and it started triggering all this stuff about expecting to be looked after. Yep. And it was the terrible terrible feelings that were coming up in me, and I'm not humble enough to to process a lot of it yeah and so i signed up for centrelink yeah and i feel very out of harmony with love there because um it's like expecting the system to look after me yeah and like i've decided that i've got this interview tomorrow and i'm just going to say the truth and but i feel i'm so really i'm really scared about everything so what's the truth josh the truth is that I, I don't, I expect to be looked after. Yeah. And that, um, <laughs> um, and I, my mind goes into confusion very easily, like, because I'm su such a resistance to a lot of things. And I, like, I'm just feeling tormented a lot because I know that I attract a lot of spirits and stuff. And yeah. I'm learning to deal with that just by praying all yeah. the time. Awesome. <laughs> but I just, uh, like, part of the reason why I was attracted to this um, this path is because I just I've desired all my life to find peace and love. And, um, <laughs> and you know, I didn't know that it was a God. Or I just wanted to create a better world. Yeah. Yeah. And my whole life is just this big lie. Yeah. And I've had to keep up this front and I'm tired of it and I'm scared of the pain. Yeah. I'm very but scared can of I, pain. Can I say it's great you're tired of keeping up the lie. That's the first part of actually living in truth is to just give up the whole facade. And, and many, many people in the audience can take from your example of giving up the facade and just stating the truth. It's great that you stated the truth. I expect other people to look after me. If it's not mum and dad, it's, you know, it's, it's Centrelink or someone else. You know, there's this expectation in me. Acknowledge that and acknowledge that even with Centrelink if you want. And, and then say, all right, what I'm willing to do is challenge that. I'll, I'll, I want to do a work for the doll type thing, right, where I'm now not expecting them to give me something without, without me doing something, you know, in terms of loving for myself. So I'm not expecting 
other people to look after myself. I want to look after myself. What happens a lot is that we have a lot of desire for people to look after us because it feels like they're loving us then. So there's a lot of emotion in you about, about when somebody's looking after me, that means they're loving me. Does that make sense? Um, one of the biggest issues I'm facing is before when you said some of the people that have the hardest trouble with this path are the people that don't, don't take action. And I'm one of those people. Yep. And um, I'm really... Like when you talk about torturous death or anything, like the last couple of weeks, all that's been on my mind is this um, stuff coming at me and then I pray yep. and forget about it. But yep. So y you could say then really that fear is your largest problem. Yeah, yep. fear, is, fear is my largest problem and yep. my fear of not being able to process fear is, you know... And um, who else has a fear of not being able to process fear? Good. Now keep your hands up. Say, I don't want to process my fear. I don't want to process my fear. All right, you need to own this. So I don't want to process my fear. And I need to own this. Because that's my responsibility. It's my responsibility. Does that make sense? So while I keep my hand up, I don't want to process this fear. That's my responsibility. And I'm doing that so that I don't have to act. So the majority of the times, what I'm trying to illustrate to you is that every time you say you, don't, you, you can't deal with your fear, you are just really saying to, you that, to yourself that you don't want to act. Does that make sense? And when you act, Josh, and it's important for everyone else, of course, in that same state, when you act, that is when the fear will be released. Myself and Mary had long chats about this. Mary, we've been talking about our passions a lot, you know, and, and Mary's had a lot of her passions. She's recognised a lot of her passions. And, uh, and obviously having that big desire to bring love to the world is a huge passion for Mary. And, uh, and part of it was a desire to also help others, right? To help others have the, you know, connect to God as well. And so I said, well, why don't you know, consider doing some... We were talking about doing some workshops... And Mary's going, no, I can't do that. Like, I can't do that because um, I'm so afraid. I want to deal with my fears first, <laughs> then I'll do the workshops, was basically what you were saying, wasn't it, darling? Uh -huh. And, then, and then, then she went through this process of making a decision that actually, if she did it that way, that she probably would never deal with the fear. All right, so what Mary then decided was, I'm going to set a date and work by that date, and I'm definitely doing the workshop that date. Does that make sense? Now, if you saw Mary from the moment she made that choice to the first workshop, most of the time she was in terror. <laughs> right? Wasn't that true? And people in the first workshop saw how Yeah, and even in the first workshop she was still in the terror, right? So, so, so it, it's the taking of the action that actually will release the fear. A few uh, months ago, I did some channeling with Monica. And a group of spirits, I think it was with Monica, it might have been with Natalie, but anyway, a group of spirits came to us, and the group of spirits were a group of female spirits who were still in their terror in the, in the spirit world. And what they were doing is they were still doing sexual acts for people who were, were, being, who were terrorizing them. Right? And they, their life on earth was that they um, were involved in prostitution and so forth on earth because of some very, what you would call pimps, some very angry men who controlled and manipulated their entire life on earth. And when they passed in the spirit world, they continued to believe that they still were under the control of these men. The men passed and so did they and they still felt under their control. And one of the things they said to them, and it's worth having a listen to, it's actually an MP3 on the, uh, as a download, is, is I said, you need to go up to these men and tell them, no matter what you want me to do, even if you want to kill me and destroy me, I am not going to do it anymore. 
Now, in the process of getting them to take that action, huge amounts of fear and terror came up in them and they were releasing and crying and releasing and crying before they could even do it. Even the thought of doing it brought up all of the emotions. And then, but they still committed and they went and did it. One of them went and did it. And she said, and she started pretty shakily and, and did it. And then, then I said, do it again. And she did it again. And then another group of them, another group, and all of them eventually did it. And you know what the men did? Well, they didn't know what to do anymore because now in the spirit world how can they how can they you know harm them they can't and and they didn't know what to do and they were just flabbergasted like they just didn't know how to handle it now on earth obviously people can choose to do damaging things to you that affect your short-term life on earth in other words a person can put a gun to your head and say do this or else all right or else i'm going to harm you in some way i'll pull the trigger or whatever at the end of the day, though, it's a very short-term thing that happens. And, by the way, a very instantaneous thing with very little pain if it happens in the way I just described. Um, <laughs> trust me, most people who have been shot feel no pain in the process. Many of them don't even know they've died when they arrive in the spirit world. That's how little pain there is involved in the process. Right? Because the instant that you're passing is the instant that certain spirits help you disconnect from the physical body and the pain itself and all these things happen. There's a beautiful, whole beautiful process that happens. And the pain that you imagine is often not the pain that you experience. In fact, you'll receive a lot more pain from long-term emotional illnesses than you will at that cause physical problems than you ever would from a passing like that. So often what we're afraid of is the, the process of passing in a violent manner, but often a violent passing is a lot easier to deal with emotionally and spiritually and also less painful than you could imagine. But that's an aside. But, the, but these spirits decided to take the step of confronting their fear by actually doing it. That's what I'm getting at. And it's the actual doing of it that means then that nobody else can affect you in any way and all of your fears come up and you shake and if you could see mary before her first workshop she many of you saw it right she was shaking her voice was shaking and everything and that that all then over the process of days she comes home and has a good cry about how afraid she is and all of that and then over the period of time so now by the time it's seven or eight of them now it's like boy that was pretty easy what's on to next you know like what can we do next uh, and that's the irony of fear. The irony of fear is that it is a false expectation that appears real. It is something that actually often will not occur that we believe will occur that causes us to, to, to not act. So every time you are afraid of the fear itself, really what you're doing is you're afraid of action. Right. When you learn how to act in your life, when you learn how to passionately desire something and go for it, no matter what opposition you receive, right, that's really what it means to have passion, you'll find you'll progress very, very rapidly. All of my personal stagnation has occurred when I've sat in my fear, trying to protect it, nurse it and prevent it, and that's been the longest possible process. I think that's really important what you just said yep. because I've definitely constructed this idea out of everything I've learned from you of, oh, you know, I'll be in a corner in a room processing my fear somewhere and for some reason that's how I've, I've absorbed the information you presented. But yep. now I'm really feeling I'm getting what you're saying and yep. just, just doing it and letting yourself process through the doing it. Yep. Yeah. I've given a talk in the past, I think it was at Brizzy, called uh, Emotions and Action really worth having a listen to that if you're having a trouble with your fear because when you act that's when you finish up confronting a lot of your stuff only when you act so for example if you feel ashamed how do you confront it you don't walk into your corner in your room and sit down and think about your shame and all that stuff right what you do instead of doing that is you grab three or four people around you who are just there it doesn't matter which ones you sit them down and say would you like to listen to all of my shame 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 shameless you know the shameless and would you like to listen to all my shame give them a choice and if they'd want to <laughs> if they want to 
then you say, okay, here I go. Well, when I was five, I stole money out of my... When I was eight, I had a sexual play with this... I mean, I never told anybody about that. And when I was, you know, 12, I actually had sex with this guy, but mum and dad would have been freaked out, and, and so I didn't tell anybody about that either. And thank God the guys kept secret. And, and then, you know, and when we go through our life, and, oh, by the way, my husband there, yeah, I've actually cheated on you, sorry about that. And... <laughs> You know, and do you want the details? And <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. Because that's a very rapid way of actually dealing with this shame. You, you, do you think you're going to hold on to it after that? After these people know? Like, what's really going... Do you think you're going to be that worried about holding on to it anymore? You can start dealing with it after that point. So it's the same with your shame, your doubts, your fears, your anger and rage and all those things. Once we learn how to speak the truth, we now are staying in the shadow or staying in the light, if you want to call it that, of the truth in our day-to-day -day lives, right? And in that moment, you are the most protected in that moment. No one can manipulate you in this moment. They can try. They, they can produce. So do you think the man who's just learnt that his wife's cheated on him is going to have a bit of anger? Of course he is, probably. Then he's going to have to deal with some of his grief about that. And you might, whole relationship may even break up as a result of this truth. But you will have learnt to live in a place where you're no longer ashamed. Does that make sense? In that process, you will have released some of that emotion. Dan, just keep your hand up there. and. AJ, why is shame the hardest for us to deal with? Is it because of my fear of judgment? I've just started getting into my shame and yeah. realising how massive it is. Yeah. Um, and even to the point where as I process through it, I'm just uncovering things that I've blocked out, obviously, because I didn't want to see it. So yeah. much shameful stuff. Where we've actually done things and we didn't even want to remember them. Yeah. That's, and in fact, Alzheimer's is caused by that desire. Sorry, what was that? Alzheimer's oh. is caused by that desire to not remember our shame. Mm. And dementia, yeah, all those emotions, yeah. Uh, they're all emotional. So it's the fear of judgment that makes it so difficult? Well, partially so. Like, a lot of people notice they come up and tell me all these secrets of their life that they haven't even told their partner. So why would they tell me? There's a lot of reasons, ju not just judgment, can you see? So, so for a start, they know that I'm not going to judge them, so that's one help. But I'm not their partner. <laughs> so there's not the potential of me leaving them as a result of, me, of them telling me the truth. Does that make sense? So that's a fear. That's a fear of their life changing, isn't it? So that's a fear that their life will change in a negative way and they don't want it to change negatively. That's their fear. Obviously, the more in harmony with love and truth we are, it can only change positively, not negatively. So any belief I have that truth is going to bring negative changes to my life, I'm out of harmony with love straight away because it's not a truth. So can you see that the motives for holding on to shame will be different in each circumstance? Some of which will be about our own personal judgment of ourselves. Some will be that we're actually horrified that we even did what we did. Do you know what I mean? And there will be moments in the, uh, that you've had in your past life where you're now horrified that you even contemplated doing those things. And so, yes, so it's that. Some of it's the terror of facing your true own condition. Some of it is your personal fears. It just depends on what the blockage is. But, but the truth is, if you just state the truth about all the things you're ashamed of, all of those blockages will automatically be exposed in that moment. If I hold on to it, then I'll have to nurse my way through it all, which may take years. It may even take my entire life on earth and some years in the spirit world. And we don't want to wait that long. You want to have a free existence, and shame causes you to not have one. You want to have a free existence, fear causes you to not have one. You want to have a free existence, doubt causes you to not have one. So deal with those emotions as soon as you possibly can. And there are things you can do to deal with them. All you need to do to deal with them is embrace the truth of it and feel free to speak the truth to people who you feel are going to want to listen to it, perhaps. So, so, and, and some of them may not want to listen to it, but uh, ask them first if they want to. If they don't want to, write it down. 
If you've got no one around you who wants to listen to the truth, write your truth down. Publish it. Make a book out of it. <laughs> I'm fair dinkum. Why not? That's what a lot of people have done who are famous, <laughs> isn't it? And they get paid for that. You'll be surprised what comes out of you staying in harmony with love and truth of yourself and, and honouring the fact that this has been your life no matter how bad it was. Can I just ask you about the, the difference between shame and sexual shame? Is, is it the same emotion but sexual shame is just a, around a sexual activity? Like, or is it actually different types of shame? There are certainly different types of shame, certainly. Some shames will relate to your gender, some will relate to the opposite gender, some will relate to your body, some will relate to your sexuality. It just depends on what the underlying causal emotions are as to which flavour of shame you will have. And you'll often have many different types. All right? So many of us, if somebody said to you, oh, um, there's a loo over there in the open, there's a hundred of us here, we're all going to watch you do a poo. <laughs> right? The majority of us in that state would feel like so, uh, a state of shame. Um, and, and, and I would probably feel like, why would I want to do that? But anyway, <laughs> um, but, the, but you can see how like, there are certain things to do with body functions, for example, that we're often ashamed of as well. So the different there are certainly different flavours of shame and, and you need to allow yourself to deal with them. But, but uh, uh, confront them. Don't, don't sit on them. Maybe that wasn't a bad... <laughs> 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 if we come down to stand in front of you. Over, it's in the middle here, so one of so one of you. Yeah. Oh, careful of the. I'm aware of um, certain um, feelings of shame, uh, particularly sexual shame, that come up when I'm processing. Well. Uh, I don't know that it's shame. All I can say is that I'll get sexual feelings when I'm in a certain, you know, uh, emotions that I'm processing. Yeah, so you might say process grief and then all of a sudden you feel horny. Yeah. I had 10 orgasms the other day, just, yeah. you know, because it's all coming up. Yeah. And um, I have actually published my, uh, things that I'm embarrassed about in books I've written and whatnot. I found it not that hard to speak it. But I, as I'm listening, I'm thinking, I don't think I've felt Exactly, it. yeah. And I can, I, okay. can I say that a lot of people speak... Uh, who, th there's two attitudes that we have to our shame mm. that we generally mm. use to manage it. One type of attitude that we have to our shame is the attitude of, I'm going to hold on to and protect my shame and I'm going to keep it secret. That's one attitude. Then there's, on the opposite end, a very angry attitude to your shame. Stuff this, I'm going to tell the world and stuff them all type of an emotion. Does that make sense? Like, and blow, if they don't like it, then they're out of my life. That's the way it is, you know? And they've either got to like it or lump it. That's another attitude to shame. But that is just as much of a denial of the underlying emotion as the, as the total shutdown of the shame itself. So my question is, uh, I'm quite sure there's some, definitely some childhood shame stuff going on for me, and I pull that out. I simply cannot go there. Yep. Um, what, what can I do? Well, the first thing you do is pray to God yeah. that you want to you develop a desire to go there. Mm. Okay. Do you want to develop <laughs> yeah. a desire to go there or not? Because it has to be a truthful de yeah. uh, prayer, you see. Mm. So d do you want to develop a desire to go there? If you don't want to say, I don't want to develop a desire to go there and help me avoid it all, which is what's currently happening. Mm -hmm. And then you can go make the step further. Or why do I, do I want to go there? Because I'm afraid of the can of worms that will probably open up. So mm -hmm. pray to God about dealing with the potential can of worms that's going to be opened by me dealing with this sexual shame issue. So then that leads, uh, because I have gone to things where I'll get little flashes and I truly wonder if I'm just making them up to justify that, oh, well, that would be it. Can, can we do that? Certainly we can. Yeah. Our, yeah. our brain is a very powerful engine based upon our emotional denial. And yeah. if we have an emotional denial of a certain type, we often can generate even images inside of our brain that causes us to support that particular denial or accept it depending on what our desire is. So certainly. In the end, you won't be able to feel an emotion from those things though. So in other words, let's say I'm processing through a lot of things and all of a sudden an image comes to me that I've been abused as a child sexually. And that image 
causes me to actually stop crying. All right? And then I think about that a few weeks and I process about that. And, but it's still, and then I wonder, oh, maybe I've been abused sexually and I think about that a lot, whatever, whatever. Right? Oftentimes that's what happens. But, but when I feel about being abused sexually, do I have an emotion? Because the emotion is the truth of the abuse. Do, do you follow me? If there's no emotion, then it's highly likely that image was just planted there by a spirit or you know, came to you through an avoidance technique that you have or whatever. Because if there is an emotion, that is the end underlying proof that something's happened there. And it could have happened with spirits, by the way, in your sleep state. It might not be a physical experience. Because remember, eight to ten hours of your life, you're in your sleep state having experiences too, which all have emotional content. I've actually gone through something like that with Millie's help. And, yeah. uh, but what I find is that still when I'm in certain, uh, and I'll just, it's usually when I'm in emotions where uh, I'm feeling oh, p time pressure or be feeling constrained, then I'll just start getting very horny. <laughs> and I wonder... Feeling very... Horny, yeah. So when yeah. only when you get time pressure? Get time pressure. And, so and also if I'm... Um, yeah, time is a huge thing for me. It triggers lots of pressure. Right, yeah. And, and, I you're often, own, and you find yourself getting horny when you're in that state? Uh, yes, that most... So can you see that the sexual stuff is a way of tuning out of the fear about the time pressure? Oh. No, I didn't see that. No? Yeah. So, see, what happens a lot of times is we, we, we often have these interior things going on within ourselves, and this is something to do with addictions. We often have interior things going on where, where we choose something pleasurable over something painful because then it helps us avoid the pain. So, so oh. this is one reason why many men masturbate, you know, three, four, five, six times a day or whatever is because they're avoiding the sadness feelings, the lonely, sad feelings that they have about women in particular. And a lot of times the sexual feeling helps them overcome that emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just realizing I also get uh, those feelings when my computer freezes up. You know, I'm just sitting there. <laughs> I'll just cross my legs and feel horny, or, you know. <laughs> So in other words, every time your anger is triggered, you revert to sexual feelings. Oh, well, is, is there shame in that? Or is that... I mean, I think, I'm, I'm sure that I've been assuming I had something to be ashamed of, but maybe something else. Yeah, well, no, no, it's your yeah. avoidance of it's anger. Avoiding my your anger. avoidance of annoyance, your avoidance of oh, frustration. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Oh, I, I can fill in this gap with a bit of sexual pleasure and then all of a sudden all the, the, you can get away with lots of anger-based emotions in that place. Do you see? Yeah. 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 And, and these, are, these are often addictive behaviours that we have, trying to get out of the real emotion. Like, how many of you prefer pleasure to pain? Oh, golly. Me. Oh, everybody. <laughs> Interesting that, right? So, so, you see, there's this automatic desire in us almost to prefer the pleasure to the pain. And so when there's a painful experience that starts rising within us, what, what are the options for personal pleasure? Not very many when you think about it, are there? If you're having a painful experience personally, there are not that many options for personal, personal pleasure in that place of pain. Aside from sex and maybe food. What else? Other addictions like drugs, cigarettes and those kind of addictions. So we turn to some kind of physically addictive action in order to avoid that painful place. So all you need to do is look at the linkage between the two. And again, it can be easily spirit influenced in that place. So every time I seek for the addiction, I am exposing myself emotionally. So, so if I seek for the addiction of sexual pleasure when, I, when I'm angry or when I feel you know, pressure-based situations, fear-based situations, a spirit can easily hook into that, can't they? All the, can you see that? And I'm also opening myself up to their manipulation of my sexual organs in that place in order to avoid the actual experience that I'm trying to avoid, which is the experience of you know, feeling under time constraint or feeling angry or feeling resistive or whatever the other emotion is. We can often... We're going to substitute pleasurable base experiences and take a lot of care in your life looking at where you substitute pleasure-based experiences in order to avoid your pain. 
It's a very powerful area to look at in your life. Yeah. Uh, and that leads me to the other question that um, I, as I'm evolving through this whole process, I'm incredibly confused about what indeed has been and is self-love, a loving act to me, yep. treating myself lovingly, because I've spent years thinking that avoiding someone's anger was being loving to myself. And of course, I see now that that's been very unloving to myself. In the sense yeah. that you didn't allow yourself to feel the barrage of the anger and work out what the underlying emotion was. Well, exactly. And uh, I, I've shut myself down so much because yep. of my fear of somebody's disapproval. Yep. And so I thought I was you know, keeping myself safe. Yep. But In reality, you were avoiding some emotions, which oh. meant you were recreating your law of attraction at another time to do the same experience over again. So I guess what I'm wondering is, as we're uh, aware of these four questions, and as I, all I can say is that for me, as I'm evolving, my awareness of what is treating myself lovingly is actually evolving. It, I, I don't and that's exactly how it happens. Yeah. Like, so rather than me giving you an answer of what is loving to yourself, yeah. you'll find that as you deal with these different emotions, you will have more and more personal consciousness within yourself as to what is loving to yourself. But remi remember Ivana's comment earlier. Remember see, she said that for the first time she's sort of realised that feeling your own emotions at the time things happen is one of the most loving things that you could do for yourself. Right? So, so in the moment that you create the horny feeling in an avoidance of the frustration, you are actually not being loving to yourself. Yeah, I Does understand that, that now. Yeah. Yeah. So if you allow yourself to feel the frustration, and there must be some kind of relationship in that in your childhood somehow too. There must be, it must have been a way that you created to avoid very frustrating situations in your childhood. You see, like I said earlier, there's very few personal ways you can have joy, you know, aside from some kind of external addiction like, you know, oh, drugs, for me. alcohol, Sugar, yeah. sweets or whatever. Imagine there's no drugs, there's no alcohol, there's no sweets, there's no smoking, there's no any of those personal external addictions available to you. So this is how we are as children most of the time. None of those external addictions are available to us. And we want to feel pleasure. What's one of the only things available to us? Sex is one of the only things available to us. It's permanently with us. It's a part of our body, able to be done at any time, pretty much, right? And so it's one of the one of the main reasons why we have addictions around sex, because it's one of the first methods that we use to get out of our emotions. Does that make sense? Yeah, I yep. get it. Yeah, and that's why many people have a lot to work through with regard. And it's not the sex that's the work that needs to work, be worked through. Obviously, it's the desire to use it to avoid something. Every time we desire to use something to avoid something else, then we're out of harmony with love. Obviously, because we need to feel the thing that uh, we're avoiding, and and that's the that's the issue that we have with sex. And it's also sex is a huge issue that spirits play into. For that reason, because most of us have learnt to avoid our emotions through sex at a very young age, or through sexual feelings at a very young age. Right? And many of us either deny them completely, shut them down completely, or you know, love to have them, either one, in order to get away from certain things emotionally. Yeah. So it's, it, we go. Um, I just want to talk a bit more about shame. AJ, please. And I, could I, I, I? Shame is an emotion. Is like I'd probably rather have a conversation about shame in a in emotional processing setting, rather than in this setting, because I there's a lot more information for me to cover okay. about the battle of the soul. And if I keep answering the emotion, the questions about shame, we won't get to cover okay. that stuff. I'll, maybe if I can talk to you afterwards as well. Well, that might be possible. Yeah. We'll okay. see. <laughs> the, uh, I, I suppose what I'm getting at is that every... What I'm getting at is there's a list of emotions, basic emotions. Fear, anger, shame and those emotions are all very core emotions that will help spirits connect to you. Right? And, so while, and, and one of the things we're illustrating here and the point of this so far is if I stay in the light of God's love and truth, in other words, if I'm truthful with everyone all the time, and I'm loving with everyone all the time, and I'm focused on that behaviour all the time, it's going to be very, very difficult for me to get out of harmony with God if I'm focused, on the, in, focused in that way. Does that make sense? And every time 
I am unloving to others, I am out of harmony with that. And any time out of harmony, I'm now out of the protection of God's love and truth and therefore inviting negative influences into my life. That's the point. So what's the second point that I wanted to raise? This is from the prayer. And help me overcome all the temptations of the flesh. Now this is really sounding a bit Christian now, isn't it? Like, <clears throat> well, I don't know what you expect coming and listening to Jesus. Of course he's going to sound Christian sometimes. <laughs> <All right>. Anyway. <clears throat> So we want protection or we want to overcome our own temptations of the flesh. <clears throat> now, as all of you know, we all have physiological responses in our body. So if I starve you for a couple of days, right, there's a pretty good chance that you'll eat almost anything. And if for a couple of weeks, there's a high likelihood you'll eat almost anything. Right? Isn't that true? The temptation of the flesh drives that in the sense that the flesh has its demands. And part one of those demands that the flesh has is to be fed. And when I don't get fed, there's some complaints that go on inside of it. Now that doesn't need to be the case if we deal with a group of emotions. But, but as we're growing towards God, that is going to be the case. The same goes with our sexual desires, as we've just been talking about. They are all part of our flesh. So as we go through the process of our hormones kicking in, and usually at, uh, in this day and age, it's usually very young age, like usually by the time we're 10, 11, 12, 13, that's all starting to happen. All these hormones, all the desires start kicking in, the sexual desires. They all then automatically become temptations of the flesh. In other words, we have a desire to meet those requirements those desires of the flesh every time we respond to a temptation of the flesh in a manner that's out of harmony with love you will always have a result of pain so, so can i say that again every time i desire to meet the temp meet the desire of the flesh whatever the desire of the flesh is sexual f uh, physical in in nature I, and, it, and if I do that out of harmony with love, in any way, out of harmony with love of myself, love of God or love of my neighbour, I will automatically feel pain. Right? That's, that's how God created our system. So it's very important that we start seeing temptations of the flesh for what they really are. And what they really are are emotional addictions to avoid certain emotions so every temptation of the flesh actually really is an emotion that you're trying to avoid at any one point in time so for example somebody comes you're in a married relationship you're married you've got a partner and you're in a, a relationship with that person and a third party comes up and projects sexually at you the temptation of the flesh, if you, aren't in, if you have some unhealed emotions in your relationship, the temptation of the flesh is going to be to accept those projections. It might be just a flirtation, or it might be deeper than that. It might, it might go deeper than that, and you might finish up even having sexual intercourse with them. Right? But either way, it's a, an addiction that is de demonstrating it, and it's a desire to get out of something generally. So most of us have all of these temptations of the flesh that you might call that are really driven by these things emotional addictions that we have so so the temptation of the flesh like the flesh wants to eat the temptation of the flesh is to overfeed it that's an emotional addiction we do that out of an emotion now to eat is a loving thing to actually eat to excess is now an unloving thing do you see the difference and and if we respond just to the temptation of the flesh without thinking about love what we're going to finish up doing is having a lot of our life driven by the desires of the flesh 
rather than love. Now, as soon as we have our desires of the flesh becoming a prominent part of our life, what happens is spirits who no longer have the ability to have their desires, their emotional addictions met by the flesh, connect to your flesh through those unhealed emotions, and they actually are a part then of that experience. That's how they connect to you. That's how they become a part of the experience. So they have an emotional addiction unhealed, just like you do. And when you respond to the temptation of the flesh, the spirit kicks in. And now the two of you are sharing the, the, your, your body's responses. So if your body's responses are sexual, the spirit's sharing the sexual response with you. If your body's response is for, for alcohol, the spirit, usually an alcoholic spirit in the spirit world, is sharing body response with you. If your body response is desire for drugs, then usually there's a spirits who are in the same place of wanting to have drugs that they can't any longer have and now now sharing the experience with you. Does that make sense? And so the desire uh, is it, very important for us to focus on overcoming the temptations of flesh, which actually means overcoming our emotional addictions to feeding our fleshly desires and looking at the underlying emotional reasons why we need to feed it that way. So if you're addicted to one type, like when I, there was a period of my life where I was addicted to Coke. Who's been addicted to Coke? Not many of you, I'm impressed. I just loved it. <laughs> anyway, I was addicted to Coke for a period of time and, uh, and my body was telling me how bad it was for me. I was getting more and more asthma and uh, a lot of other problems I was having. My body was just telling me. And what it was was the sugar hit, you know, and what that did for me during my day because I felt quite, if I just allowed myself to feel, I was running four companies at the time and, and uh, my, had a, my wife was depressed and, and I had two young children and I was doing everything I could possibly do, I was sleeping about five hours a day, not allowing myself any rest. And in that place, Coke was a fantastic way, the caffeine and the sugar, fantastic way for me to feel like I had the energy to do all that. Does that make sense? If I, if I cut out the coke, cut out the addiction, wow, now it's now feeling pretty bad. Like all of a sudden all of the real reasons why I want the coke is, is pre are present. So you could say in that state the coke uh, was my temptation of the flesh, to feed the flesh something so that I could feel good when in reality it was actually making me feel worse. And this is the truth with all addictions. They all, in the end, make you feel worse. And that's how it works. But if we overcome the temptations of flesh, what actually happens is you get out of the zone of always feeding it with what it wants. So temptation of the flesh, comfort. Temptation of the flesh, food. Temptation of the flesh, alcohol. Temptation of the flesh, smoking, drugs sex, all these different temptations of the flesh, when I start realising that if I bring everything inside of me harmonious with love and truth, then all of those things, many of them disappear, the other ones come into harmony with love and truth, and now I don't feel pain from them anymore. And this is one of the major benefits of doing that. But on top of that, no spirit can now influence me through one of those temptations. So many of the people who are overweight, for example, are having spirits attached to them who want them to eat because they want to eat. Does that make sense? Many of us who have addictive tendency with sexual like, masturbation and things like that, there are spirits attached to us at those locations because, at those times because we haven't overcome the temptation of the flesh, right? Sorry, was that, did I say something? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So there are spirits attached to us in that place and in that place we are easily manipulated. Easily manipulated. It's so easy, you'd be surprised how easy it is. When you're a spirit, you'll be very surprised how easy it is. It's just like you just drop a little tiny thought, chink, and bang, the person does what you want. Yeah. If it was that easy for you, let's say you passed in the spirit world and you weren't having sex anymore because the location you were in in the spirit world meant there weren't too many of the opposite sex in that same location and none of them were very attractive to you anyway because they all had the same emotions you had. Um, imagine for a moment if you could come back to the earth and then just stick with a woman here or a man here on earth and just drop one little thought and you get some sex. Imagine how tempting that would be. 
Can you see why, like, most spirits are earthbound? Most spirits are earthbound because they're just acting out their unhealed emotions through the earth because it's so easy. And as soon as we start blocking that and overcoming those temptations of the flesh, what happens is that we'll get pressure emotionally to go back into the same place. Once we go, get over that pressure and we bring ourselves into the harmony with love and truth, what happens is all of a sudden it's like nobody can tempt us anymore. Nobody can come up to say, oh, I'll give you $1,000 if you do this. You know? Nobody can come up to say, oh, you, know, you want a bit of sex on the side, nobody will know, you know. Nobody can come up to you and say any of those things. None of those things will happen to you anymore. Your soul doesn't even desire them anymore, so it's not even in your law of attraction anymore. That's a very powerful place where you now are following your own passions and desires and not being influenced by lots and lots of people externally and particularly lots of spirits. So it's very powerful. So does everyone get that? What's involved with that? Yeah? Is there any questions about the subject about temptations of the flesh? If we can have a... Why don't uh, there's no mic uh, coming through. Can we just... You turn it on, off, actually. And the power has to be on. Why don't the spirits if you bring it here. The power has to be on. <laughs> talking to it talking to it no, it's still on. if you ring it here I'll, I'll sort it out quick there's no, no battery it looks like it's dead is it <laughs> can we have the other mic thank you awesome thank you <laughs> Someone doesn't want me to ask this question. <laughs> You're in there now. <laughs> uh, why don't the spirits simply hang out with couples who have lots of sex? Um, because, because sex in a loving relationship isn't addictive and therefore no spirit can attach under those conditions. Simple as that. Simple as that. So, so while I'm in a loving interaction with my partner, it's impossible for a spirit to, to be, be a part of that loving interaction. It's impossible for the spirit to share the interaction sexually. So therefore, they don't want to. They won't hang around with pet partners in that place. Yep, instantly, like they just go away. They don't even bother watching because they don't get anything out of it. How frustrating would it be to watch somebody having sex when you're not having a sexual feeling? be quite frustrating right if you, that's what you wanted to do so they don't even do that so so there is no danger of spirits interfering in your relationship sexually while you are both in a loving place with each other it's only when you get out of harmony with the loving place and into an addictive place now spirits can hook in in some way or the other so let's say the woman is addicted to avoiding her shame and the man's addicted to um what could he be addicted to under those like under that circumstance He's, he's, in, he's in lust with her or something like that. But anyway, it's probably a bad example because those law of attraction probably wouldn't work. But, but with, the, with the woman avoiding her shame, now there's a lot of spirits who are now going to be projecting through the opening that she has about shame, sexual shame. Does that make sense? So they are now going to be se sitting with her while she's in the sex act, projecting at her, you shameful hussy, you, you know, all that kind of emotion, which will make the woman feel even more ashamed. It's part of the law of attraction. But, but they're, they're experiencing a sexual gratification from making her feel more ashamed. Does that make sense? So they get off on making her feel worse. That's how they hook. If, if, a spirit, if, a spirit, if, the loving, if the relationship is loving and the people are both loving to themselves, involved in the sexual partnership, then it's impossible for a spirit to have any part of it and they won't even want to. They, they just go away. Yeah, don't, not even with you. Yeah. Good question, though. Um, if we go yep, across to here, if you keep your hand up, so well, yep, they know where it's going. I have a question about food. Do humans have to eat? Um, the truth is, we don't have to eat. Um, once we heal with a whole group of emotions, you don't have to eat. The truth is, though, probably you'd like to. Uh, continue eating certain mm. things because um, you'll find that certain things have a really rejuvenating effect upon you even when you're at one with God you'll notice that at times 
where your energy is depleted and things like that because you've given out a lot. And there are times when certain foods certainly will replenish you faster than if you just uh, don't eat at all. But the truth is your, human, your body is able to be sustained energetically without eating. And that's been proven on the planet anyway. Uh, there's people in, in other countries, in particular in India. Yeah, living on light. On living on light, they say, and, uh, and uh, been like that for three, four, five, six hundred days and three, four, five, six years. And Th there is no spirit connection there? Right? Uh, most of the time there is, yes. Most of the time they have a spirit that's keeping their energy up, yeah. Um, but the truth is you can do it yourself without just with the connection with God. The, the thing is that God doesn't want you to stop all your desires. God wants to bring you in harmony with truth and love with all of your desires. Does that make sense? So, so God, you know, there's this common concept that God wants to stop you having sex. Well, that's a bit crazy. Like he creates your sexual organs and then tells you that the only way to connect to God is by not using them. You know, that, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Like, but obviously have them in harmony with love and truth. Does that make sense? That's what God wants with everything that we do, including food. Yeah, but at the moment there's a lot of um, the quality of food that's degrading so much. Yeah, and, and to be frank, too many of you are far too concerned about it um, because it's your soul that matters the most, not the food you eat. I, I said in the first century, worry more about what comes out of your mouth than what goes into it because, <laughs> because what goes into it uh, you know, it can feed the body and you can transform a lot of it. But what comes out of it is damaging your soul in most cases. Do you know what I mean? Like, so worry more about what's coming out of your mouth than what you're putting into it. So, you know, if you don't have organic this and whatever that today, well, so be it. No, it's not a panic. You, your body's able to cope with lots of impurity. Like, I, I'm laughing. We, myself and Mary have been laughing a bit. We, last night we watched a bit of telly, hey, and we noticed all these ads about bacteria and germs. Have you seen that lately? <laughs> Just all this fear stuff. And I'm going like, there's billions and billions of germs in your body. Why would you like want to get rid of one that's on a, on a floor or something? And, and it's just like, what's going on? It's just fear-based stuff. It's a lack of trust in how God's created everything. The truth is right now in your body, you've got billions of germs that your body's peacefully cohabiting with through your soul condition. But as soon as your soul condition changes... Some of those germs get, become active and now we've got a problem. So focus on the soul condition. Focus on the cause. Focus on the cause, all the effects get dealt with. Yep, same yeah. applies to all food. Thank you. Yep. So I, no, I, the way I said it in the first century is that, um, something like, it's not, it's not what a man puts into his mouth that condemns him. It's what comes out of it. Mm. If we go up the back again there. AJ, on a humanitarian level, um, we had a talk the other night of there's a lot of sex slaves being used and they're sold by their parents, you know all about it, they're from four to seven, there's a lot of men queuing up, they're just being used, by the time they're 18 they're actually discarded and there's a lot of rebuilding things. I can understand on a bigger picture why it's happening, a lot of people are being helpful. On an energetic level, is there anything we can do to help the girls and maybe the people that are queuing? <laughs> because they've obviously got a lot of lower spirits around and it's happening in a lot of the third world countries. Mm -hmm. Certainly there is. Um, most of it is spirit influenced and driven, of course. So, so look at all of your own emotions, of your fears about spirits, your fears about sexuality, your fear of being... Like for many of you ladies, you've got fear of being used by men sexually as an emotion. Does that make sense? Many of you have that emotion. That emotion contributes to this experience for them. You see, every... S I said... Uh, I don't know if I said it here. Um, I think I said it down in Melbourne, I think. Um, it is, is that every single thing that comes into your law of attraction is actually exposing something within yourself. So, for example, if you read in a newspaper about this stuff happening in Thailand... Well, now it's your law of attraction. There's something inside of you that is actually helping create this problem in Thailand. D does that make sense? And we need to see our lives like this. So, so if it's about sex slaves, the first thing to do, 
many of you ladies, deal with the emotions you feel about men's control of you sexually. Many of you have not even touched them yet. Many of you are pushing your soulmates away like they're the plague at the moment, right? Many of you don't even want your soulmate in your life, right? Because of what he might do, because he might desire you sexually. Right? So, so deal with all those emotions. For the males, of course, we need to do the same with regard to our own feelings about women and using them for sex and all those kind of things. We need to do the same as that. Many of Many, of, many males do have a belief that, that women are there for their sexual gratification. Right? And that needs to be dealt with. Now, as we deal with these emotions, we'll find firstly that the spirit attraction on the earth to creating these kind of events will automatically lessen. And as a result of that, more and more people will see the truth and less people will be involved in doing these things. Now, these people all have mums and dads both the men who are involved in it and the women, the girls who are being given to them. And how do we help the mums and dads? Because that's the real issue really. And we do that again by dealing with our emotions about what we feel about our own mothers and fathers and how we have acted unlovingly ourselves as parents. Do you know what I mean? So there's a lot we can do about every situation even if we can't physically go over to the situation and personally fix it. Because our soul has this ability to influence every situation. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I found that's answered another question because I personally didn't get involved. Like it didn't affect me, but I really saw massive emotions. And you're lying to yourself talk. right now. I'm sorry, <laughs> because you're mentioning it in a question, and you've read about it, or somehow the information has come to you, which is telling you that you have an unhealed emotion about this inside of you. D does that make sense? Right at the moment that the law of attraction hits us, we're automatically being demonstrated to it's automatically being demonstrated to us that we have an unhealed emotion related to this issue. So you can say it didn't affect you, but I'm saying to you there's something inside of your soul that needs to look at this particular thing. Something inside of you that needs to be addressed emotionally for you to have even noticed this event. Well, this was actually just a public talk. It doesn't that matter. We went to. So you're still not getting what I'm saying. Anything that comes into your sphere of operation, anything that comes into your knowledge, anything that is attracted to your life in whatever way it's attracted to your life is an indication of something unhealed within yourself. Okay, I'll look at that. Can everyone, <laughs> can everyone understand the power of that? If we understand that one truth, you can work through lots of things. That's the power of it, right? If you can get that truth that every single little tiny thing that comes to me is actually a result of my own law of attraction and therefore usually the result of something unhealed within myself. That's a very powerful place. You'll heal lots of things if you allow that. By telling yourself, I wasn't affected by that, you are basically ignoring God's messenger of truth to you. Remember, God's messenger of truth to you is your law of attraction. That's how God, why God created that law, was to give you truth constantly about your condition. Weren't you also saying, though, that if there's emotion of, of all the degrees, that that's where you knew you had something to deal with? And, and I know there's certain times where, yeah, you cannot acknowledge and repress. So if, if you're not having an emotion, but another, on another hand you're actually saying you have an emotion to deal with, where does that come in between? No, what I'm saying is that if your law of attraction brings you an event, you definitely have an emotion. <laughs> definitely. There's no ifs or buffs about it. There is definitely something inside of you that brings you this event. Now, sometimes it can be truthful, right? But, but most of the time we, we need to assume if we're not yet at one with God that every event bring, brought to us is the result of an unloving emotion, don't we? Why not make that assumption and then uh, let, uh, you know, go along with that assumption initially? Because that's really where we need to do. Because most of the time we are totally willing to avoid a lot of things. And we are totally willing to... And what we're totally willing to do with world problems, by the way, is say, oh, but that's happening over there. You know? 
We always do this, do we? Do we not? But that's, happening, that's not happening here. Aren't we lucky? It's not happening here. You know? The truth is, half the time, we Australians are creating these events. We are creating them because of our desire for, for uh, like this so called abundance that we have, which is not economical. Like, if, if everyone in the world lived like we live, most, of it, most people would need, we'd need four worlds to handle the resources. Right? The truth is we're not facing up to that most of the time. We're not facing up to the fact that in Thailand, the reason why, why parents sell children to sex slaves, to be used as sex slaves, is because the parent usually has a group of emotions related to us here in Australia. One of those emotions is they want to have abundance in their life. They want to have money. Right? Why do they want that? Because they see us with money and they think, oh, that life would be nice and comfortable and they're willing to sacrifice their own child for it. And don't think you haven't sacrificed your own child for it either because everyone here who has children has. How many times have you sacrificed deal having time with your own child just for the sake of your work? Isn't that the same thing? You see, this is where we've got to see these things, you see, as our law of attraction. Can you see that? And be really honest about it. When we're really honest about it, we can then go into the emotion and look at the emotion. And we can see everything as, ah, oh, this is an opportunity for me to see the truth about myself and heal it. Every one of these events. Yep. Thanks, so, Joe. I'll look forward to the next journey. No worries. And the next se section of the prayer is to avoid the influences... Fluence of evil spirits. Basic truth there are evil spirits. <laughs> like, don't think that there's people in the spirit world who just have your wonderful life in mind, in the sense of a positive way. You know, they want to help you. That's not the case at all. There are many of them who want to do their best to harm you. There are many of them too who also just want to do their best to get what they want, even if that harms you. So they're not necessarily as bad as the ones who just want to harm you, but they're perfectly willing to have you addicted to a drug so that they can be on drugs. They're perfectly willing to have you addicted to some drink and alcohol so that they can have the taste of alcohol and the feeling that the alcohol gives them. All right? They're perfectly willing to do that. They might ruin your life doing it. I've spoken to you before about one man who ruined the pancreas of four generations of men. They all died from diabetes and he just went from the next generation to the next generation to the next generation to the next generation connecting to each one of those men to just satisfy an emotion within himself that he couldn't satisfy any other way. Now, you can actively avoid the influence of evil spirits you know when they're around and anger and rage and shame and guilt and all these other emotions we've been talking about all are heightened generally when they're around most of us know when they're present and you know the environments that they hang out in do you not like you go to a bar you know, hotel for a drink do you think that the spirits hanging out there are all teetotalers? <laughs> of course not. They're all ones who want to have a drink. And they want to share a drink with you. Right? So it's up to you what you do with that, but the knowledge of that's very helpful, isn't it? Do you think you go along to a uh, prostitute's place, right? Do you think there's going to be a whole group of spirits there who are not interested in sex at all? Of course not. Do you think they're going to be not interested in loving sex at all? Of course they're not going to be interested in loving sex, right? They're there sitting at her house wanting to watch a few people connect with her or, and connect with that emotionally. So why would you frequent there? Does that make sense? You know these things are happening, so allow yourself to avoid the influence of them. Don't make choices that, or continue to make choices just so that you get your 
temptations of the flesh fulfilled, thinking that you are going to somehow avoid the consequences. Because we're not ever going to avoid consequences. Does that make sense? So allow yourself to avoid their influence. Avoid their influence by staying. Remember, if you stay in love and truth at all times, you'll be able to walk into a place like that, notice it's there, speak your truth. This isn't a very good place. There's actually five or six spirits here. I can fool them. Um, you're trying to get, you're here because of this, 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 and whatever else you wanted to do in that place, if you want to do anything in that place. And you'll be able to walk out without being influenced, without taking one of them home with you, one of those spirits home with you or something like that. But if you want to go along with the influence of spirits, there are many seeming advantages that you will have with that. Like, for example, if you want to go along with a male spirit who wants to hook you up sexually, I can guarantee to you that you're going to have more sex with different people in your life. Now, that might seem like an advantage, right? But actually, it's going to have its consequences, right? If you want to um, avoid the influence of, of spirits who are going to cause you to, to connect with the shame inside of yourself and actually live in your shame, right, then, then stop punishing yourself for what you've done. Because every time you punish yourself for what you've done, you would just allow them to punish you. That's what you do. So we've got to be firm with ourselves and avoid their influence. If we just punish ourselves, you know, beat ourselves up emotionally or even physically, all we're doing is we're falling into their hands. That's not loving. And they, they would be perfectly willing to do that. Does that make sense? Every single time you feel a feeling inside of yourself that you want to avoid your emotion, you attract a group of spirits with you who will help you avoid your emotion. So are you avoiding their influence in that state? Definitely not. They're going to help you avoid your emotion. And they'll love doing that because they think they're doing you a favour. Right? And so you can talk to them about that. I don't want to do this now. I'm going to deal with this emotion. Right? How about rage? It's the same issue, can you see? Every time, many of you have gotten into a habit of projecting anger and rage at me. Right? You sort of substitute me for your dad. Right? And I'm not your daddy. But you substitute me. And so, so instead of being angry with your fathers, you have opportunities that come up in your life to be angry with me. And you project all of that at me. And sometimes with your mothers it's to do with Mary. And you project all of that rage at her. Right? And in that moment, do you think... See, there's been spirits for 2,000 years wanting to harm myself and Mary. Don't you think they have a lot of fun with that? You see, this is why many of you, whenever you have a feeling of rage or anger towards myself or Mary, have a long time in that rage or anger towards us because you're heavily influenced in that space to stay in that place of anger and rage. Does that make sense? Because they want, to, they want to get to us. They want to make us and our life uncomfortable. And you're just being in a vehicle for that to occur. Now what we've been doing, Mary and myself, is we've been stepping away more and more from some of you who have wanted to do that. Now some of you have felt the personal effects of that. Where we've stepped away from involvement in your personal life more and more because we don't want to encourage these spirits to give you a vehicle of just affecting us through your rage. Does that make sense? But it's something that can be dealt with quite easily. Every time you feel rage and anger towards myself or Mary, understand you are going to be influenced by a spirit in that state. You are going to. Because there are so many spirits, and there are literally millions of spirits in the spirit world who want to see the divine truth dead on this earth. And if, you can, if they can affect you to affect the people who are sort of promoting the divine truth on earth, do you think they're going to do that? Of course they are. And this is why many of you stay in anger or resistance with myself or Mary longer than you stay in anger and resistance to your own parents. 
Because the truth is there is a large group of spirits in the spirit world who desire you to project all of this anger and rage that you actually have towards your own parents, towards us, so that, so that, so that things happen badly in terms of the movement of divine truth on earth. Does that make sense? That's their focus. So you can stop hooking into that or you can choose to hook into that. Many of you over the coming months with media pressures and other pressures in your life from your family and friends, you are going to be very tempted to hook into that. And when you do, you'll find yourself heavily influenced in anger and rage towards myself or Mary and hopefully you'll remember the words I've just spoken to you in that state. But it's very, very hard to remember when you're in a rage. Have you noticed that? Very hard. And you justify it, don't you, at the time, don't you? You think, oh, I deserve to be angry with them. They publicly humiliated me and so forth. Right? This is the kind of thing that happens. That's not how I feel. I never want to public humiliate anybody. But I'll definitely tell you the truth in public if you tell me a lie in public. <laughs> Does that make sense? I'll definitely do that. And it's not to humiliate you, it's just to correct the untruth in public and that's certainly what I'll do so uh, can you understand that if we we can actively avoid their influence can you see that there's a lot of things we can do to avoid their influence just make a stand make a stand many of us act in fear with them why are you afraid of spirits who have less strength than yourself because often it's taking hundreds of them to actually influence you why are you afraid of them why are you hooking into them because you have an emotion. Many times the emotion is, I don't love myself. So if you love yourself, you will stop allowing spirits to manipulate you. Right? If you love yourself. Stop allowing them from having these effects upon you. Talk to them by all means, but stop allowing them to have unleavening effects on your life. Right? The truth is they can only have an unloving effect on your life while you don't love yourself in, their inter in the interaction with them. So love yourself in your interaction with them. Yeah? George, you want to ask? No. There's no switch at the top. Okay, thanks. Um, I just wanted to, to add, um, during my life's journey, with, while we're on the avoid the influence of evil spirits, I've worked alongside with many mediums talking to, to external forces or spirits. Yep. Yep. I, I just wanted to add to it also that a lot of spirits c can come through and gain control through trust, and then as they're gaining, gaining your trust, they do that to gain control and power over you spot on yeah yeah mm -hmm. yep so i just wanted to add that to what totally you already said. yeah so a lot of them will set up events for you so mm -hmm. for example um they might set up a whole series of really good events for you so ah, oh, this gets set up that gets set up um i don't want to bring up personal illustrations in this but there's many that i could give of what's happened in many of your lives up to now where personal things have happened to you that you've actually thought were good but but Actually, we can see that there's spirits who are in very dark places manipulating those events and making them all smooth for you. And you think, oh, my life's going smoothly. Isn't this wonderful? All the things fitting in place. Lovely, lovely. You know, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm feeling this energy run through me. It's so beautiful. It's wonderful on the divine love path. Isn't it? And right on that, in that space, you're not actually on the divine love path. What you have is just allow these spirits who connect with your energy systems of your body, pump you full of this energy that feels really powerful and nice and you feel really good and then they connect you with some of the emotions that you have unhealed. Like, for example, the emotion to, to feel powerful or the emotion to have glory or the emotion to feel special and those kind of things. And what they do then is they use this trust now that's been established to get those things from you. And I've seen this happen over and over and over and over again for many people. And the more mediumistic you are, the higher the likelihood it's going to happen to you. Any one of your unhealed emotions becomes an avenue that they can then use. And all they need to do is develop a, a, a basis of trust. And you can say, 
And you hear this quite frequently. Oh, yes, my new, my new spirit guide was, is now um, like the apostle whatever, you know. You go, oh, yeah, no worries. And what's the apostle whatever telling you? Oh, well, he's giving me all these wonderful feelings passing through me. And some of them even feel a bit sexual, you know, like, um, and, and everything. And, I'm, and you're going, hmm, does this sound like a, a person who's now at one with God? who's now connecting to the person. It feels good, but is it real? Is it real? Of course not. So, so we need to allow ourselves to see that it's not. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I'm just going to continue with this because um, there's one more thing that I'd like to say. Um, so the part of this, uh, the, the prayer was, the, and the influence of the powers of evil ones which so constantly surround me and endeavour to turn my thoughts away from you, from God, toward the pleasures and allurements of the world. And this is what... Have a look at that. What is the dominant thing you are thinking about in your life? Because, because if, if your dominant thing that you're thinking about is not firstly God and your connection with God, secondly, yourself and the connection with your own soul and reflecting love and truth at every moment, and thirdly, connecting with your soulmate and reflecting love and truth in that environment at the moment, then there is already a disharmony within us out of, that's out of harmony with God's divine truth. So, for example, I don't want to think about my soulmate at all. I don't want to hear who my soulmate is. I don't want to know who she, he or she is. I don't want to feel for her. I don't, I've got my own stuff to work through. Now, if that's what's going on for you, you're blind to one thing in particular, and that is you're not bringing your love into harmony with the way God designed you. Right? And every time you're thinking about something that's different to that, bringing yourself into harmony with the love of God and the love of you and your soulmate and then the love of others, you are out of harmony with the way God created her universe. And when we're out of harmony with the way God created her universe, we can't but create other things. You see, when you are really focused on your relationship with God primarily and that nothing else can shake that relationship you will find that no matter what happens in your life, you're not going to get off this path. But if you're not focused on that and you're focused on other things, for example, many of you are focused on your physical well-being. In other words, you're worried every time you have an ache and pain in your body, right? Many of you still. And you're worried that, oh, I might not be eating the right thing or might not be, maybe it's this emotion. But, but why is the focus on your body and your body's pain? Because you want comfort and you want other things, right? Now, true, on the divine love path, when you work through your emotions, you will have a lot of those, well, eventually all of those things resolved. But while you're focused on that, if that is your first focus in your life, is that, if that's where all your time and your energy and your effort goes, not much is going to be left for the real thing, which is developing your soul and growing towards God and entering this at one moment relationship with God. Focus your energy first on that, first on that, and everything else will result. That's why I said in the first century the words, put first, and in the Bible it's written, God's kingdom, and I'd like to say, put first God's love, and all other things will come to you. Right? All other things will come to you. But you know what we do? We don't trust that very much. So what we do is we don't put first God's love, we put first a lot of other things. And that's what we need to learn to do. In fact, in the battle for your soul, that is one of the best things you can do. To make a firm, heart-based commitment to your own relationship with God. Where that becomes your total motivator for everything that you do. And once you get to that stage what will happen is things will happen through your life and they'll hardly matter to you because everything is focused on this relationship with God. That's all you want, firstly. And then all these other things will be added to you anyway. 
So can I just say in conclusion that this battle for your soul is a very intense and emotional battle, if you haven't already noticed that. <laughs> right? and, and what will happen in your life is that you can give up for a little while, if you want, but all that happens is you still have to make the battle in the end. So everything that you give up now, later on, will have to be addressed at some point. So why bother giving it up now? Why not just battle away with your soul? Focus on those major things, no? particularly staying in love and truth, Partic particularly that. It'll bring up so much for you if you learn to act in harmony with love and truth everywhere in your life with what you believe to be love and truth, even right at this moment, is better than <laughs> not acting at all. Right? And if you do that, you'll find that you'll win this battle quite easily. If you don't do that, you'll find you'll become one of the battle casualties for a while. Does that make sense? Right? You'll feel exhausted, under somebody else's control, you'll feel like you're giving up, and there'll be moments where you feel like a casualty, and you need to work your way through that even emotionally and reconnect with God every time. And there are so many wonderful tools we have to prevent ourselves from becoming a battle casualty. But remember, there's so many spirits who want you to be a casualty. They want you to be a casualty of this battle. They want you to be in darkness for thousands of years, just like they are. In fact, many of them would want you to even be worse than them. Some of them look at the power of your own soul and they actually think it would be wonderful if they could have the advantage of the power of your soul in a negative direction. That's how they see you. Some of them look at you and go, wow, there's a very powerful person, there's a very powerful person, there's a very powerful... If I could have that power in an evil way, wow, what damage could we do? How do you think ones like Hitler got chosen? Can you see how they got chosen? There was, there, was, there was in their soul the ability for a lot of power which could have been used for good or evil. right? And then these evil spirits just get on to them right? and manipulate the events and the circumstances and the situations to such a degree that the person on earth then becomes a powerful tool for the evil influence. Right? And that's how... Somebody asked earlier how you get into that location in the hills. That's how you get there. By becoming a powerful, powerful person in an evil way. And historically, you've known many of the people who were there. You've heard of them, you know. When, when I was alive, the person, Nero, was one of those persons. Powerful influence in a negative way. He was passionate in his evil he is now a celestial spirit. Right? But in the first century, many of the so-called evil spirits wanted to use him as their leader at the time. Right? Many of the ones you know, like Stalin, Hitler and those ones, who have been influenced by these groups of evil spirits into world domination and genocide. That's their desire. I'm not going to answer another question, sorry, Anna. So does everyone get the understanding that firstly, you have a battle going on for your soul. Secondly, while your soul condition increases, the battle will feel like it's increasing to a degree because you become more of an object. See, the more light you have, the more of an object of notice you become in the spirit world. Right? And thirdly, you realize how you can deal with it. How you deal with it is these ways that are mentioned in the prayer that was given to you. Yeah? And if you can allow yourself to look at those ways in your life and in particular learn to stay in love and truth no matter how afraid you are, no matter how ashamed of yourself you are doing it, no matter how fearful you are and no matter how angry you get at times, stay in that place of love and truth, allow yourself to really sit there in that place and ask for God's help to stay there, you are not going to succumb 
to the battle of your soul and you are going to be the owner of your soul instead of a whole group of other people around you being the owner of your soul. Because if you look at it at the moment, many of us are, an, are owned by the environment we are living in still. We are not our real self yet and we are not being our free self yet. And we have the capacity, this wonderful capacity to be this free individual, but it's going to require courage. And so courage is such an important thing for us to develop. Thanks for your time again, guys. And uh, great. We're, we're really enjoying seeing your progress, hey? We're really enjoying seeing your progress. And each time we seem to come along to these events, um, many of you have changed. And it's just wonderful seeing the changes you're making in your own life without much assistance at all. Um, your desire and passion for getting closer to God is driving many of you now into this place where you just want to get closer to God and want to be closer to your own emotions and you want to attract your soulmate in your life. And it's just so wonderful to see these changes that you're making. Some of you are still feeling stuck. We can see that. And we're trying to do our best to try and help give you over the coming months uh, as much to provide as much assistance as possible to get you through those blockages. And please don't feel it's competition. Every one of you have had different lives. Some of you have, have, have had terrible, terrible childhoods right, in comparison with others here. And, and we recognise that and we and, and of course God recognises that in you. So don't feel that just because other people are doing well and you don't feel to be doing that well, that you're not actually. You need to allow yourself to see yourself truthfully. If we've had a very damaging childhood, obviously we're going to have some, we're going to obviously have quite a few emotions to work through. And God is patient with us and he loves us through that process. So we need to learn to love ourselves through that process and not berate ourselves in comparison with others. So we just wanted to remind you of those things, that we love you very much and uh, we're looking forward to seeing what happens over the coming months. We feel there's quite a few good things that are going to happen over the coming months and we're looking forward to being a part of those things with you. So it's going to be very much fun. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow, if you want to come tomorrow. And, uh, and I, like I said, I'm sorry, I don't know the subject, so you'll have to just take pot luck on that. <laughs> good night for now.